right. Um, good to have you guys back. <laughs> Sorry for the technical hiccups. Yeah. Hi Karina, I see that you're here. Okay. Hi Karina. Mm, okay. Hey, sorry for the hiccups. No worries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, trying to stream from the desktop and I realized that uh, um, there's no way in the desktop uh, mode to have another person join in. Oh. Yeah, it's just kind of some, some kind of work around. So uh, let's see uh, whether there are questions, right? Okay. Uh, from anyone? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay, hello everyone. If you are just joining into this chat, um, feel free to send us some questions about DID, right? Or actually about anything else for that matter, right? I'm gonna monitor my telegram from uh, AJ, who will, who will certainly help us to um, uh, highlight some questions that that may surface. Okay. Hello, Opfu. Hello, Melly, JH. Uh, sorry, I don't know. Or Mel, right? Uh, see, Susie. Okay, so we'll fill in some of this time. Uh, Maybe, maybe in a bit, I'll just ask Karina to introduce herself. Uh, she's a final year anyway, uh, and I'll uh, have her introduce herself shortly. But uh, I see some uh, introductory questions that AJ has sent to us. Uh, the belief in the way I teach, meaning that uh, what do I believe in and therefore what do I teach? Uh, one of the main things that I uh, believe in is that uh, creativity can be trained um, and also creative process can be engineered. You know, it's not somewhat of like, uh, elusive quality where you sit down and you wait and wait and wait to have a spark. Um, there are techniques, um, especially those of you who are uh, sometimes worried whether, you know, as a science student, as a student who has never really done art or anything uh, um, that would be considered like in the creative fields. Um, we do have a lot of uh, students in our uh, school um, who are from um, much more uh, like technical or science type of backgrounds um, where uh, you know they deploy the rational thinking um, to their projects um, and then of course they learn to create a spark um, through creative processes yeah so um, industrial design is very much uh, uh, or as we kind of like speak about it you know the, the the school is more and more evolving towards the direction of like integrated design where we bring um, more things together than just um, mass produced industrial products, right? Um, so uh, industrial design or integrated design is moving more and more towards um, not just uh, not just the aesthetic sides of things, not just the art side of things, but um, yeah, but also how things work, uh, what's the experience like for people. So um, certainly if you, if you ever have uh, thoughts around um, or worries around uh, that, uh, it'd be great uh, to, to, you know, uh, to share, um, but also to just to let you know that, um, yeah, uh, that many of us, you know, myself included, uh, was originally from a very science-like background. Um, I see some questions come in, but maybe Karina, you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, okay, hi, I'm Karina. I'm a current year for industrial design student, so I'm going to graduate soon. Uh, yeah, I'm also in USP, so um, I do ID plus USP in NUS. And yeah, I also went on NOC, so if anyone has any questions about that, can also ask in the live chat. Yeah, Karina's a really, uh, I would say, one of our best. Right? Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have very many good students and I think Karina's one of our best. Um, 
you know, I've taught her a number of times in different uh, projects. Um, so, yeah, you can ask her questions on what school is like. You know, she, she has a really good um, um, grasp of um, design from a really imaginative standpoint as well as from um, interaction design uh, side uh, from a very technical standpoint as well. Okay. Um, I see Okfu has a question. Um, Okfu, um, I don't know if I'm saying your name correctly. How involved was Diad in the recent Forager show in NDC? Um, the, I'm not super sure about the content of the Forager show, but uh, from what I know, uh, that started off as a project uh, in, in uh, NUS led by Hans, one of our um, other teachers over here. Right? Uh, if you've seen in the Forager uh, show, uh, things like objects uh, like vacuum cleaners and what made up of uh, made up of uh, components from different sca scavenged uh, things uh, then uh, those those projects are from the students in, in the US. Um, I encourage you to check out our YouTube uh, channel um, because uh, I know uh, to be very very honest we don't upkeep it uh, well but um, we're starting to put up a lot of uh, student works um, just because we've realized that this year, maybe it's just better to um, show you what you're getting yourself into, right? You know, uh, we've, we've always sometimes thought that uh, school promotions have to be a certain way, like it has to use certain big words, you know, to, to advertise. But um, I think this year we're taking a different way. We're just going to show you what the students do um, and what they say. And so you will see uh, some of the works from the Forager uh, class uh, inside there. So uh, in fact, actually, as I'm speaking, you will see a number of uh, maybe two or three projects already uploaded. Uh, if you check out like the videos that uh, start with this term called C for Compose, right, uh, you will see some of those over there. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Um, let's... Karina, are you able to see questions? Uh, it's just the comments, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just the comments. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Aloysius, what are the aptitude-based admissions judged by? Uh, that changes from time to time. Uh, by time to time, I mean before COVID and after COVID, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so uh, in the past, uh, there's there's interviews. There's uh, what we we will look at your portfolio. Uh, if you have one, uh, else uh, we will just have a conversation with you about your interests, your hobbies, right, and what uh, maybe creative pursuits or entrepreneurial pursuits you have been uh, up to, right? Um, with uh, the original type of aptitude uh, assessment, there is also a task that we do uh, live together with you to ask you to critique some objects and how you improve them. But now, um, with COVID, since last year, we've, we've asked students to submit uh, uh, video, um, kind of a short video of themselves, right, with certain guidelines and questions. Um, now, uh, this year, um, we are still uh, kind of inventing that uh, that upgrade to the admissions process. Uh, I think that it will largely be the same, uh, same kind of topics of uh, judging your creative and entrepreneurial pursuits and also seeing you converse uh, and, and, and your openness, your maturity, and your knowledge of design. But uh, the system will be more automated than uh, asking you to create a video yourself. Right? Uh, you will see that, uh, that, that there will be some difference this year if you happen to know about last year. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see. Yeah. Ofu, you are saying that you hire many of our designers. Um, very curious where you're from, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very curious. If you can drop a note there, let, let us know where you're from. Um, yeah. Uh, incidentally, uh, I also, um, because I'm, uh, I was also from DID uh, many years ago, and then um, I teach uh, at DID, but also I run a design agency. My, my agency, uh, called Stuck Design, also hires a lot of uh, NUS uh, designers, so I'm also a fan. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we are like a 30, 30 plus uh, man team, I think 33, um, and I think about uh, two thirds are from NUS Industrial Design. Okay, 
I see, let's see, any more notes. Okay, I see AJ telling us that we can pin questions. Oh, agency, all right, I see. Uh, so you're with Pete and uh, Lishan. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, yeah, you, you have some of us with you, right? Like, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think is Tsufeng with you? I'm not very sure. Karina, anything to add? No, no. <laughs> so sometimes in our these early sessions, uh, um, like first one of the whole season, right? Um, there will be some quietness. Um, so, yeah, I'm just rambling on. <laughs> Wait, AJ says that you can pin submitted questions on the screen and that the questions are not in the comment thread, which means that I cannot see the questions. Oh, oh, I see, I see. I can see the comments, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I didn't see the questions too. Great, great. I, there's another, so there's another Q&A uh, uh, a box. Okay, let me see how do I pin. Let me see, ah. Uh. How do I pin this? Okay. Okay, let's, let's not go to this. Let's see whether there are... Okay, let's let's look at Susie's question. Uh, Susie, Susie Kwan, uh, what is the cost intake for poly students, specifically for non Ivy diploma grads? Uh, because you're from Visual Com, um, I don't know if there is a very hard number, right, in terms of percentages. Um, Karina, what's the number of people in your class that are from poly? Ratio? Uh, as in from product design poly or from... No, just poly in general. Who, oh, I don't know. I don't know the ratio. <laughs> like maybe like 10, if you include the product design people. So it's usually, so usually like, about a quarter, right? About, yeah, about a quarter, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and there's a mix of people who were were ID related uh, grants uh, and, and they come in sometimes directly in the second year. Um, and then there's also a mixture of uh, others who come in uh, right from first year because they are in a not so related uh, discipline. Um, but yeah, uh, we uh, we have, I think over the last uh, years, been having uh, poly students who do really well in the end. I mean, they come with very strong skill sets um, already uh, beforehand and they, 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 with the kind of uh, thinking in um, training, uh, um, training in thinking, right? Over here at the ID, they 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 end up having kind of best of both worlds. Okay, um, Susie, let me know if that answers your question. Sorry, it's not very specific, but um, we can certainly uh, take this question in and give you a more specific answer um, uh, later on. Okay, uh, but yeah, please, uh, because we we might not have the right way to reach you. Uh, just if you can join our Telegram so that you can uh, make sure that the questions are answered, we can post it to you there. Directly. Um, let me just, if you want to, let me just type something in. Huh? I'm going to just type uh, the web address, which is, yeah, which also can be found on our profile. And I think if you go over there, you probably can get a link to our website and then see the Telegram group from there. Okay. All right, Susie, yeah. great. Good that you join. Uh, we will uh we will kind of uh, follow up on that answer. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, Aloysius. Uh, okay, maybe let's let's have Karina start to answer this question too. Uh, Aloysius is asking, what trend do you feel ID in Singapore will be heading towards over the next few years? Uh, now from a student uh, perspective, uh, year four and seeing things change in school also, I think maybe she can give some interesting. I'll take on this. I, then after that, I will share also. Okay. Uh, I think my opinion is that like when you when I first joined ID, uh, there was semi more focus on like actual product design. So like more three D objects, things that you can touch and feel and play with. So like maybe the software that you use is more of like Rhino or like Keyshot. So things that you actually wanna make in like real life. But now now like there are, there's a trend towards more like digital based services. 
more, like I call them services rather than products, but I know everyone labels them differently. So um, yeah, the way I the way I see is that like um, I think Singapore is a more service based economy anyway. Like, I don't think we do a lot of like manufacturing. Like correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure. But so I feel like we will like Singapore will generally gear towards like more digital based products, and so then the nature of ID like will naturally gravitate towards like more digital based like prototyping tools and like building software, um like that kind of products or services. Yeah. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely see that occurring uh, more and more. Um but it's also design's way of um moving itself into fields that uh don't normally have design uh considered. So um one can say that uh you know uh places like in government uh like in banks uh um and maybe even i mean not so much medical but uh but now more um uh where where design maybe has been traditionally kept out um just because maybe it seems like the field is uh no place for creativity <laughs> right um but uh but you you will see that uh, because these industries are starting to recognize more and more the impact of design and how it changes how businesses function how uh they cater solutions for their users um therefore design is shifting that um uh not because I think we are facing like a drought uh, so much in the other aspects of design, but um, because uh, design is extending its reach. And that's why you see the government uh, kind of uh, trying to uh, advocate for more and more students uh, in the younger years to do design, do design thinking. Um, yeah, so design is, is going into a very interesting space where more and more we try to mix um, disciplines together. So you will see uh, students who are like Karina, right, uh, who from product starts to do more and more digital, right, um, but who is equally competent at product. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like this is a better field or not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Aloysius, hopefully that uh, answers part of your question. Um, I will say if, if I were to answer um, as a practitioner, um, seeing how the industry has changed over the years, um, the constant that I think uh, will remain uh, is that um, designers will still be sought after for their ability to uh, create um, new kinds of uh, propositions uh, when others are going for standard answers. Right? Design often is about providing the counterpoint um, you know, and not just uh, the, the expected uh, things because we question a lot more. Um, and secondly, designers will still be valued for their ability to learn fast and understand uh, different fields and situations fast. And then, of course, to propose the, the solutions from there. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think that won't change. Uh, in fact, that might be even more emphasized as we go in more and more towards multiple disciplines. Right? Uh, the, the core becomes more emphasized and it gets less confused as uh, like, you know, designers only do like physical objects or what. Now that, the, now that the, the, the output is very varied, then we ask what is the call. So that call will, will become clear. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see if Fu has something to say that is in the comments, not in the questions. That's all right. Uh, for students who are thinking about something like DID over a course that is focusing into a trend like UX design. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, do you see... What do you see as the benefit of going to, to, to a place like DID? Right? Uh, I'm really an Instagram note. Let me see. Okay, let me just, I'm sorry to think now. Um, well, in DID, you might see that we are seldom chasing after a uh, trend because trends come and trends go. Right? Um, UI UX came and now UI UX is a little bit uh, in my opinion, slightly sunset. Uh, everybody says they are UI UX designer, but of course, done well and done um, in an inventive manner, um, that's of course still different, right? Um, so throughout these changes that will occur in the industry, you know, a sudden obsession with design thinking, sudden obsession with UX research, sudden obsession with UI, right? Um, uh, the idea has been there. You know, we've been we've been trying to build. Uh, 
a kind of DNA in our students and also the way to approach problems um, and to approach new changes um, instead of being uh, at the mercy of a trend coming and going. Okay, so it's a certain kind of uh, investigative uh, spirit and also imaginative uh, capability. Um, and then also the kind of rigor uh, that uh, allows us to create um, uh, that kind of uh, future resilient type of uh, innovator, um, whichever field uh, uh, starts to emerge more and more. Now, at DID, one of the main interesting strengths is uh, that uh, we have a rather diverse and broad team of tutors. It's almost, to be very frank, right, um, and we're going to publish this soon uh, in our new sites for the uh, this open day season, or uh, this this you know this uh, admission season, uh, you will see that like it's it almost seems like the whole industry of practitioners in Singapore is teaching at DID, right? Um, so it's, <laughs> yeah, I, I I'm not I'm not really kidding. It really seems like that. When I saw the list myself, I was like, oh yeah, we really have everyone here, more or less. Okay, so um, so uh, you will see that because of that broad uh spectrum and that uh, questioning that goes on between the tutors and between projects. Um, we, we sharpen students uh, to have that kind of um, future uh, resilient type of uh, creativity. Okay, um, so that, that would be that. Uh, looking at also the way the course is structured, you will see that because uh, tutors are all allowed to um, teach um, whatever they find most uh, timely and fruitful, um, and students are allowed to pick what they what they want to do that is most uh, beneficial to them or most interesting to them. So the course essentially is constantly updated. So when UX may be a trend, uh, uh, you know, you will see in the years prior to that, courses start to emphasize that a bit more. So it's quite like a um, responsive type of uh, place uh, to study at. Okay, very relevant uh, projects. Uh, as you will see as we start to publish all the real works uh, in this year's um, uh, outreach campaign. Uh, Karina, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think I think when we studied UI UX, sometimes we don't label it UI UX also. So it's kind of like, I guess now industry picks up on this trend and we label it as like UI UX. But actually like in DID, sometimes it's just like we're crafting the user journey and crafting touch points. So it's kind of like we, I think that um, a good thing about st studying DID, like to answer back your questions, like um, I think you mentioned something about trends and like what is the benefit of studying ID. It's kind of like, um, yeah, so like trends come and go, but I think like the philosophy behind like the, the thought process, behind the design process is kind of like what like ID stays true to regardless of what it's being called. And then we adapt accordingly to like what industry needs. Or at least I feel like that's how I've learned. Yeah, like, Especially UI UX is definitely more relevant now, but I feel like when I was in year one, we didn't really call it that. Yeah, but the skills is like still transferable in that way. Yeah. Great. Uh, I see some questions from Gibson. Gibson, who I believe I know. Uh, the uh, let me let me just post. There are two questions from him uh, relating to USP. So Karina, it's all for you actually. In fact, there are three questions that are all for you. So I'll give you one at a time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the question is, I'm an incoming ID and USP student. I'd like to ask for advice on juggling both. Um, I would say it gets better. I think year, year one is the toughest. Uh, but you have to juggle a lot of core USP mods and core ID mods. And you don't have a lot of like, flexibility with your time. So I don't really have any <laughs> advice. Except like, you, like it gets better. And once you get through the first year, I think it gets much better from then on. Um, I think it's... I think it's I think it's like the combination of ID and USP is good because um, USP really teaches you to like think critically and okay, not saying that ID doesn't, but it's, it's kind of like, it's a good mix because in USP, you're definitely more focused on like more academia stuff. Maybe like your mode of thinking is more reading, writing. Whereas in ID, your mode of thinking may be more like, um, uh, like talking to people and um, making and doing and prototyping as a way of thinking. So like merging the two ways of thinking together, is like actually, mm. I feel like it, it helps to strengthen like in both ways like whether you do id stuff or like usp stuff um yeah but in terms of juggling it's just like i i, I think there's there's no advice except like you you'll make it true like after after first year it gets much better yeah okay <laughs> yeah uh related to i mean gibson asked the second question which is uh the same question but uh, there's someone called aid banana walnut cereal so <laughs> um the the related to workload for usp 
and okay. Ivy also. Uh, uh, what wait, can everyone see the question or must I read it out loud? I think everyone should I be able to see the question. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. How does USP complement your ID studies? Um, honestly, you just answered actually, that, right? Uh, yeah, like in, in terms of ways of thinking, but in terms of things that are very concrete, I would say that there are not a lot of connections unless you make them yourself. So, um, like for my thesis now, I'm trying to like think of like better ways to communicate like issues about the world or like just communicate anything in general um, through like with through digital experiences. And then a lot of the content of what I'm dealing with is stuff that I've studied in USP. But like I've, sort of made the connection to see like well, how can design help to communicate these ideas that I have sort of thought about USP in a more like critical man critical everyday manner. Um, I know like some seniors also have like taken what they've learned in USP that is very like abstract and theoretical and tried to make it try to think about how can design serve as a tool to like communicate this or to kind of like articulate things that are more concrete in nature. So I think it's kind of like the connection is up for you to make and I feel like there are not a lot of direct links. But um, yeah, it's helpful and it's like quite, it, it's kind of like a creative way in which you can try to like merge like things that are more concrete because I think like design is like slightly more concrete, like things that you can see and more tangible. But USP is more like abstract, things that are more theoretical. So it's interesting to see how you can like, um, kind of like, like it's a spectrum. So you can see how you can try to like flow along that spectrum with what you learn in ID and USP. What mods did I take and is the workload huge? Um, ID and USP are very fixed um, mods, and I don't really know the new curriculum. <laughs> so uh, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this question, but um, if, you are, if you are already in USP and if you're already in ID, like once you join USP, there'll be like peer mentors to help you figure out your timetable. And uh, so there's a lot of guidance there, so like don't worry. Uh, I think the workload is huge when you're in year one. I think year one is really the toughest. Yeah. Um, and then in year four now, it's like I have some, I have some, USP mods that I still have to do, but a lot of my classmates um, are not taking any additional mods that are like graded. So, but, but it's still manageable. I think year one is really the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, I see Okfu giving some comments. Uh, Okfu is beginning to sound like a more we planted in this conversation because of the, <laughs> yeah, of the kind of uh, appreciative praise that you have for DID uh, students who you have hired. Well, uh, for the rest, certainly Alpu uh, is not uh, planted here by us, but uh, thanks Alpu for your, for your um, comments. Um, indeed, um, we, we, we don't chase after trends uh, that much, right? Uh, we, we respond to it, we create output that is timely, but um, uh, it's a fundamental type of DNA in uh, the students that we're training. And uh, like you, um, you know, uh, for me, running stuck design, um, I found that uh, the students that we hire from DID really do very well. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, to be another kind of a side note here is, you know, you've, you've kind of mentioned that human-centered and not trend-centered, right? Um, we also quite uh, like that. Uh, we, 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 we're, you know, increasingly um, aware of the distinction between even user-centeredness and human-centeredness. And then maybe... Uh, to elevate that even more to life centeredness instead of just being around people yeah so um yeah it's 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 a constant questioning of what are we teaching and what what are we equipping our students to be okay um but that also creates a bit of a difficulty because then you know they are like a, a rather broad base and you can't really sometimes describe a domain or skill exactly that uh, you know that they can lay claim to so sometimes uh, they are a bit like a hidden gem. You hire them and then you realize, oh, I can really do everything, you know, and can do things with such a good perspective. Uh, um, yeah, but, but normally uh, it's not so, um, it's not so, um, what do you call that, uh, describable. Um, but nonetheless, uh, for everyone listening, uh, you will see, um, because we, we do have this kind of results, I think uniquely in uh, Singapore as a design school, we really have... Uh, uh, this type of results that we don't talk about much. Uh, this year, we're going to talk about it a lot, right? Um, you, you, if you look at the YouTube uh, channels, you will really start to see um, sharings pouring in from our students who have, you know, who are at Google, who are at Facebook, who are, you know, um, PNG, and more are coming in soon. There'll be LinkedIn, people who work at LinkedIn as lead uh, designers, um, yeah, Zendesk, uh, Grab, right? 
um, all are coming in, right? We just uh, never really celebrated it uh, that much um, just because I think we're just busy doing things and not busy promoting ourselves. But um, we realized that uh, sometimes uh, many of you just need to see that like, hey, these students, uh, they do go places, okay? So, um, yeah, uh, I think some of these organizations are beginning to feel like um, uh, yeah, DID students are really uh, um, capable when you plug them into their teams. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. Yeah, keep your questions coming because uh, we have, oh yeah, we have one uh, Jia En, or if that's the way to say uh, your name, right? Uh, there are two questions from you. Uh, let me see which one should we go first, huh? Um, let's answer something that's less combative first, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, where do you guys have your overseas internships or exchange? Uh, many, many places. Uh, Karina, did you go somewhere? You went, right? I, you went I went for NOC. So yeah. it's not really part of ID. As ID has their own set of schools that they are affiliated to for exchange. And I think you can go for internship as long as you can find an internship anywhere, right? No, no. The internship requirement is it has to be reputable enough. Right, oh, okay. but yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't want you to end up going somewhere and then making coffee, right? Um, they, they, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there is some some requirement for it to be uh, of a certain stature at least. Um, exchange. We have a very broad uh, partnerships with many many universities, but um, you you would have to know that COVID is uh, causing this to be majorly halted throughout the whole university itself, not just us. Um, but uh, I think every cohort. Uh, around at least two-thirds of the students go for exchange. Uh, yeah, so so most of the time around two-thirds go for exchange. So all of them would have uh, some interesting overseas exposure, uh, which I think many of them find to be quite formative for them. Uh, now, uh, I don't know how things will be like with COVID, um, but uh, certainly if things start to revert to the usual norm, I think you will expect to see this coming back. Okay? Uh, Chan, uh, no, no, um, uh, Karina, where, you say you went to NOC, can you share with the rest where you went and how was it like? Uh, so I went to Stockholm. So NOC is basically like an entrepreneurship program part of NUS where you go to one of their partner schools in their partner, in a, in a particular country and you basically take, um, you basically intern for a company and for a startup and you also take um, entrepreneurship mods there. So I went to Stockholm and I interned for like a creative agency. So it was a small prototyping agency. And yeah, it was it was really fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, how was it like? Uh, it was very cool, <laughs> but it's a good learning experience because you kind of like. For me, I think I learned more about like this, like work, like design industry rather than. Um, I think uh, for exchange, the main difference is that you learn how design is taught in another another school. So I didn't really experience that, but I just kind of like experienced a bit more about how people approach design and what's the perception of design in, especially like in the, in Scandinavia. Because um, I think over there, people care about design more. So it's very interesting to see how, like, um, like when you're working with clients and stuff, how they really value, um, like, design. Yeah. Mm. Uh, um, let me see. All right. Uh, I'm just going to answer this other question by Tian also, right? Uh, this is the one that's a little bit tricky to answer. Not because, uh, yeah, we don't have to answer. It's just like, you know, we don't want to kind of misrepresent other schools. Right, so um, I, what I'm going to say is this. Uh, what I will share with you what I think is distinctive about our course. I won't compare ourselves with others just because it's not so professional to do so. I, from what I know about our course, what's distinctive is that we really have a huge team of uh, teachers uh, who, are, who are industry experts, right? And also uh, uh, people who are amongst the best teachers uh, even in the US, right? From a teaching... Uh, teaching um, uh, teaching performance standpoint, right? Okay, so, uh, so you, you get really good dialogue and uh, uh, challenge uh, to your, your thinking. And then uh, if you ask Karina, the whole relationship and uh, process of education is very much like conversational mentoring, right? So you, you, you get a super low kind of like teacher to student ratio. Um, even if the class sometimes may feel like kind of big, but then actually in your experience with it, you'll find that like it's, it's, uh, you get access to the teachers uh, a lot. Um, then the other thing that's distinctive about our course is uh, somewhat described earlier on because we shape our program uh, to uh, provide 
uh, you the choice to pick your projects and pick uh, the tutors that you want to work with over the course of from your year two all the way to your year four uh, type of uh, period. Um, uh, every semester you get to pick um, two projects out of 12, around, around 12, right? Uh, which means that you have a constantly evolving uh, palette of options uh, that, that uh, changing also according to the way industry comes to collaborate with us or what's emerging as a uh, uh, need. Um, so therefore you have very, very timely uh, type of curriculum. Uh, there's almost uh, no kind of a uh, syllabus um, and that's one of the beauties, I think, at, uh, at DID. Um, now, uh, another little trick that we have uh, up our sleeves in that is that um, these projects uh, that you take every semester, two of it, uh, every semester, out of 12, which you choose, right, um, is done vertically, which means that uh, your project teammates are from year two, year three, year four students. Um, and this is how we engineer the kind of uh, uh, cross-learning um, because sometimes different years do get different trends and emphasis, right? And they have they pick up different sets of skills, and also the so the exchange is very good uh, for the team. Uh, secondly, um, the transference of skills also happens not just from teachers to students, so you're learning from your classmates a lot. Um, this for us also creates a very interesting and tight uh, industry network because um, when you graduate, you find that like you have your classmates, yes, but you also know everybody else uh, in the school, right? Um, and and it's kind of like one big uh, family. Um, who collaborates together. So these are the, I would say, the, the key distinctives of DID. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and if you were to say difference, right, uh, this year again, uh, I would say that uh, we will just publish for once, right, um, the works of the students and the students' own words. Okay, so... Uh, I think we've, we've been, uh, you know, the idea is that as a school is not so kind of, uh, uh, we don't have such huge advertising budgets like uh, a whole university, right? So um, we don't focus so much on like, ads that try to tell you things um, uh, aspirationally, right? Um, which I don't think is wrong, but I think that for us, uh, maybe it's just time to rely on actual, actually what goes on here. So we will show you the, the real things that go on, right? And then I think you can see just from the works, the history, the track record, and where the students go to work in the end, uh, you will see the difference. Okay, hope that answers your question um, without talking about other schools. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Let me bring up another one. Uh, actually, how long do these lives last? Because uh? I, I know that it cuts off by itself after a while, so I just don't want to... I think one hour. I think okay, great. One hour. Okay, great, great. So we still have time. Um, uh, yeah, and, and since we have time, right, Karina, I'm going to ask you to add to this question as a student. This this question, the one here. Mm, yeah, yeah. As a student, I mean, I, I'm, I'm selling it, right? I'm a teacher. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so you but, probably, uh, you know, just just for for full disclosure, Karina has zero benefit in trying to do this with us. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, she's, not, she's not paid. She's not uh, anything. She's really just a student. Right? Sharing uh, whatever that she thinks is worth sharing. Okay. Yeah, mm. I think you covered most bases already. But I, I think what I appreciate about I and I'm not sure about other schools because I, I didn't really check about like the curriculum of other schools. But I quite like the the fact that you can choose whatever you want, what kind of design you want to explore. And I like the fact that there's no specialization. I'm not sure whether other schools have a specialization where maybe you pick like UI UX and then you do more UI UX projects as you like go into higher years. But for us, it's kind of like there's really just this pool of projects. And sometimes the projects are also like, you know, a bit of UI UX and like motion design, like combined, that kind of thing. Or like, I, I heard that there are even more innovative stuff now, like textile design and stuff. So um, you can really like choose to dabble and explore, which is what I, I like. I don't really know whether that's the best thing for industry. But like, for instance, my portfolio is like really diverse. Like I have just a bit of like uh, speculative projects or like more like practical uh, projects and stuff like that. So that's what I like. Like, there's no restrictions on, like, what the limit to what you can do. Like, for instance, if you really, really, really like UI UX, you can also do all UI UX projects. So then your portfolio will naturally become more UI UX centered, which, like, I guess is more specialized. So it's really up to you how you want to craft the kind of projects that you want to do, which I appreciate. Yeah, and also I think um, having group work that is done in a vertical way, like Don mentioned just now, is quite 
useful. Like it's not just like oh seniors guides juniors, but it's kind of like even now there's so many new softwares, so many new like um kind of like trends. I know we, we said just now that we don't really follow trends, but it's kind of like just as the emergence of like new technology, like um even like lingo, how to connect with like the younger generation. Sometimes I think it's quite interesting to see how my juniors use stuff like TikTok and like see how they're also like, you know, um it's also like uh, reflection of like the progression of like society so yeah it's so interesting to see like I mean I mean I make it sound like I'm so much older than them I mean I'm not uh, but but it's just kind of like yeah interesting to see how like um, people who are younger also like uh, deal with new technologies yeah okay I'm gonna add a bit to what Karina just said um, with regards to your uh, choices right um Sometimes you may see uh, programs uh, asking you to specialize and make a decision at year two, right? Um, we, we don't, we ask you to do that right from the first day. <laughs> no, what I mean is that you're actually constantly crafting your course, right? And as you, as you go through that four years, uh, the type might shift, your, your understanding of yourself and your interests and your strength areas might shift. So your decisions can remain constant and you can gun for a certain specialization. But at the same time, you can also gun for an evolving specialization uh, as you kind of know yourself better. Or you can go for a very broad-based type of uh, devil in everything, which is seldom something you get to do when you go to work, right? Um, if you talk to some of the seniors um, who have already graduated, uh, go watch a video by uh, Marcus, uh, who is working now at Facebook, right? Um, one of his uh, key advice for students is get as broad an exposure as you can. Uh, while you're in school, uh, dabble in all kinds of uh, design and all kinds of de design methods and process and uh, even tools and uh, domains, right? Because, you know, um, like like asked earlier, right, um, design uh, and a certain kind of DNA is what we're trying to craft here that doesn't change, you know, doesn't, you know, get obsolete with time, um, trends change. So it's when you kind of uh, operate on a broad scale, you start to not become like a, master of none but you become a master of the core kind of uh, thinking behind all of these things right the unified thinking so that's actually what uh, sharpens you and makes you resilient uh, and, and, and always relevant in the long run so um, highly recommend that you uh, take advantage of this uh, freedom here um, at the same time I would also say it's good to um, exercise a bit of ability to specialize and go deep in some areas Right, because that trains your ability to learn and uh, and 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 master one area well. Um, so at the idea you can do that at your right mixture that you prefer. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see another question. I, let's see. Yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm going through all the questions, please. Okay, quick one. I will just take this question. Uh, Loisius uh, Xavier. How does an applicant who has work-related experience rank against someone who has high GPA? Um, okay, so let me let, let you in on a little secret, right? Um, if you get into the admissions interview, only your admissions interview matters. Okay, um, if you get into the admissions interview, only your admissions interview matters. Um, meaning that, meaning that, um, uh, you know, your high GPA, high A-level results will certainly um, be advantageous uh, when you are initially applying. Mm. But when you get into the interview, uh, the interview counts uh, much, much more. In fact, and that's where um, you with uh, work-related experience uh, will, uh, I would speculate and say that you will likely shine um, in, in those moments because uh, you, you hold the conversation at a very different level, uh, much more mature with some experience to life. But of course, that can come as a baggage too, right? Um, because uh, you, you might get uh, trapped into a certain way to see things just because of conditioning at work. Um, we've had a really interesting mix of uh, people at DID, uh, including uh, people who have uh, worked to the top of their careers, you know, um, in big government institutions, uh, leaving those institutions. And after they are like 40 something, 50, they come back and want to do a DID program. <laughs> right? We've had that. Okay. Um, so I uh, hope that answers your question. Boishas. Uh, we, we have a mixture, right? There's some who actually work a few years in design agencies. And um, let's see, actually. Um, we, you see someone called Ling Kwa, you know, in the, in the chat comments. 
Uh, Ning actually is a current student now. Uh, she worked for a few years uh, in a local design agency before she joined the ID. Right, just as an example. Okay, um, let me find another question. All right. Sorry for some of you who have been waiting very long for your question to be answered. <laughs> uh, let me find some. Huh? Um, Samuel, what's the proportion of physics, chem, engineering, CS in ID? Um, I, I'm trying to get precise with this question. You know, maybe you can, can add a comment below to just uh, clarify it. Uh, are you talking about like how much of this is taught in ID? Or are you talking about how many of such students are in ID? Samuel, if you're still here. Yeah. Maybe drop us a little comment so that we know. I can answer um, the second question first. Does one need to be great in these areas? Okay, um, you, you go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are some like engineering or physics-based modules that you have to take as like a year one or, or two student. Uh, but they are not a lot. Like I see, the majority of the work is still platforms, um, which is the more like industry based or like more like project based kind of work. Um, so it would it would help if you have a physics background, but um, I I would I don't have a I don't have a physics background, and like you can still do like okay in those modules even if you don't have a background because um, the way that it's taught is quite basic. It's really like fundamentals. Um, and as for computer science, um, I think it definitely helps if you know how to code because that means that you have more opportunity to use coding for design as well. And then that can help with um, like platform work also or like if you want to do anything that's slightly more technical in nature, which definitely some platforms are more geared towards. Mm. So I'll say it's like advantageous to, to, to know how to code and like have a bit of computer science background, but it's not necessary. If that's not what you're interested in and you prefer maybe more... Uh, non-technical related kind of design you can just choose those projects as well and then you can also do fine um, or if you are keen on learning more about like computer science in a design way then you can join those platforms uh, find a group mate that is good at computer science and then like team up with them and create something together so yeah I, I would say you don't need to be great in these areas but some of them are definitely advantageous so if you are interested in that kind of design yeah hmm. So uh, Samuel, I'm going to add to this question. Basically in design, you will find that um, the prevailing rhetoric now in the, even in the government side is to ask you to be interdisciplinary, right? Meaning that uh, if you can combine multiple subjects uh, and be um, mini experts in different areas, you will find that your, your opportunity for um, innovation is a lot higher. Um, so in DID, we certainly want to cultivate that and therefore we allow you to stretch into these uh, domains. Um, uh, we, we do uh, have in-house, in you know, uh, the uh, support for guiding you through um, some level of useful coding and also electronics uh, so that you can be able to operate in the creative technology space. Um, at the same time, you know, in NUS, uh, being a broad-based uh, school that is also increasingly interdisciplinary, you'll find that you have many chances to dabble into engineering more if you want to, right? including software engineering. Okay, so um, uh, some of you m might have heard in the wind, right, um, that uh, some of this news, but uh, the School of Design, the School of Engineering is going to merge right, in NUS. And so uh, it's going to happen um, right from this coming semester, right? So that only means good things because uh, it just means that if you really like to traverse this uh, space of combining such uh, disciplines, you can do it even more effectively now um, and you can collaborate more with uh, students of different specializations too. Now, um, I want to uh, give another point here uh, about combining uh, or rather kind of uh, being uh, exposed you know, to say physics, chem, engine, uh, psychology even you know, um, as, as very useful additions to design. Um, certainly coding is. Now, uh, for me as uh, my own background, um, uh, I was a physics, uh, kind of like physics econs, uh, math kind of student, right? Um, before I joined DID many, many years ago. So, um, but being quite inclined mechanically um, uh, as a person, uh, I brought that to design and it was at his, it has its own um, advantages 
right? Um, because the projects that I was able to do, the things that I'm able to recall from things I've learned in science in the many, many years ago, uh, they work themselves into my projects. So uh, I'm sorry, it's going to seem a bit like a, uh, like a show, show and tell here, but um, if, you, if, you, uh, uh, if you're familiar with this product, right? This is the Microsoft Attach Mouse. Right, so gonna be, you know, uh, this mechanism that bends and snaps like that uh, is invented by me, right? And this is, you know, I I attribute this to my um, fascination with the physics uh, and science world of things. And so when I operate uh, uh, the time in the consultancy, um, and Microsoft had this challenge of how do we get a mouse to behave somewhat ideally from flat to rigid. Um, these things came back, right? Uh, the things that you learn in, in secondary school, in primary school, in JC came back, right? And then they connect and suddenly you can create something like that, which sometimes, uh, um, sometimes, I mean, not always, but uh, designers might, uh, engineers might find a little bit elusive. Like, how did you piece that piece of information from this mechanism to a design problem like that? And so that's what happened, right? For the Arctouch mouse. Um, so hopefully um, that, uh, yeah, can't tell, yeah, like, like, I don't really like to kind of show this because it almost seems like, you know, I'm doing a show and tell of myself. Uh, but uh, I think this makes the point. And hopefully, um, and now this actually, maybe you might find that mechanisms and, uh, and physics for a designer might be a little bit old school, right? And that's why I belong a bit to the old school generation. Um, so nothing much to flex here. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the in thing now is the people combine coding, you know, electronics with... Uh, uh, design okay so i'm showing you something hopefully you see something for yourself that is in in the computing and electronic space okay all right <laughs> yeah sorry i know i know i hate it actually to be honest i hate doing this um <laughs> yeah uh peddling uh peddling this stuff type of stuff but let's see let's see questions uh, again um I know time is catching up. We have, I think, maybe about seven minutes. Um, Aloysius, uh, I think your question is somewhat answered uh, here. You know, uh, generally, specialists uh, mentioned that somewhat early on. Uh, that is, it's probably good to be uh, multi-curious, right? And uh, quite good at specializing and being a generalist, right? Uh, that's that's uh, one one of the. Uh, things that are good, good about design. Because design, actually, you consider things beyond just the technical problem at hand. You see things from, you know, for, for a product to end up, or even a software product or a service product, you know, um, for it to work with human beings, right, um, many factors occur. Business has to occur. Um, how to engage communicatively with people has to occur. How to produce things well has to occur. How to, you know, uh, all a whole slew of things has to occur, right? Um, and so the more multi-curious you are, uh, the more, the bigger picture you see, right? And, uh, and you don't kind of operate just as, a, 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 oh, let me optimize the, the durability of this thing. You know, that's, that's, that's when you get very specialized in a certain technical field, right? So um, inventing for, or innovating for human beings, um, the more you are aware of, uh, the better. But of course, uh, you don't want to be just a loose generalist. It's best if you can, you know, have one or two areas of, uh, in-depth uh, specialization, that would be, that'd be good because it makes you a competent team member. Someone asks you something, you know how to solve it, okay? And you add something to the table. Okay. Um, oh, many, many questions. Karina, you can answer this if you want to, uh, still, and I can find something else. Wait, this one, this existing question. Yeah. Uh, I think we answered it already. Okay, okay, then we skip it, okay? Mm, uh, Oh, this one is interesting. Ideal candidate for ID from a tutor and student point of view. Uh, you go first, uh, Karina. Uh, wow, okay. I think someone who is curious and, and like uh, willing to learn how to learn. Because in design, there are like many different things that you can be good at. Like there are different softwares that you can be good at. And so you need to be able to kind of like, when there's a new software to learn, like the mindset shouldn't be like, oh my God, like so many things I need to like know. But it's more about just like, oh, how 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 willing are you to be open-minded to learn something new? So I think like throughout the, my four years in ID, it's kind of like, you know, you see different softwares that you have to learn. Once you've sort of like learned one, you may not even use it for a project. Then you realize that, oh no, there's another tool that is better for what I want to do. Then you need to kind of like shift gears and like use another software. Um, so I think someone who is um, 
kind of like open-minded and willing to learn um, and not see like learning as like a thing that is like, like enjoy the learning process rather than seeing it as a means to an end. Yeah. What else? Someone who's creative, <laughs> uh, willing to like um, think out of the box and like kind of like sit with uncertainty and like not knowing whether what you're doing will have an outcome, but just doing it anyway and like hoping that you will get somewhere. Uh, <laughs> What else? Um, yeah, I think those are my answers. Okay, I, I just build on that a little bit as an educator, all right? Um, now, uh, Karina mentioned that you have to be open-minded, uh, creative, think out of the box. Um, I would just say that at DID, um, maybe uh, in your first year, uh, before you come, you may still have to learn to do that. And so therefore, uh, I'll adjust that, that, that preference uh, from, like you say, from a tutor's point of view, right? Uh, someone who's willing to have your mind uh, start to be open up, right? Someone who's willing to learn how to be creative, right? Um, would be key, uh, key requirements for me. And of course, um, at DID, you certainly have to work rather hard, okay? Um, the, just a little example, you know, thinking out of the box. Uh, for most people, this phrase, thinking out of the box, sounds very much like a really good uh, uh, rule to follow by. Um, uh, but for many who haven't been initiated uh, on it, uh, it's always like, okay, <laughs> you know, uh, I know I have to think of the box, but how, right? Um, what box? Where's the box? I don't see the box, you know, <laughs> how to think out of it. So, um, you know, at DID, uh, we also try to train you to understand how to do these things. So if you're willing to do it, you know, um, the way that I teach it uh, is not so much to throw you in this ocean of feeling like you have to be outside of some box, but rather to equip you to think inside better boxes. Right? That's a lot more doable than to um, try to be outside of the current box that you're in. Okay? Um, so, so um, therefore, uh, if, if you're willing, you're interested, I think, um, and certainly if you have a natural uh, uh, gifting in this area, that would be great. But, you know, gifting is one of those things that you can't tell so soon. Right, uh, you can judge by interest as an initial hint of your potential strength. Right, I, when I came into the idea at the start, I couldn't draw. Uh, I felt that like my idea sucked. <laughs> right, uh, and uh, you are constantly wondering like why are your peers uh, doing much cooler projects than you? Um, and then I found that um, over the years of struggling and unraveling this uh, interest area of mine, even though you feel a little bit ill-equipped at the start um, or not so naturally talented, talented, I found that like. Um, my own uh, strength was in deciphering how to be creative, right? And, and, and therefore, you know, uh, I've made methods of it to teach students how to do it. Right? Um, that's, that's my story, right? Uh, so you don't have to uh, really be immediately uh, artistic, curious, uh, creative. You just want, have to want to be. Okay. Um, so, so let's... See, uh, Susie has an interesting question, simple one, I guess. Uh, prototyping, production, you know, uh, equi equipment or facilities. Um, I, I, for it to be truthful, I like Karina's answer. Right. Yeah, I can't see the question. Uh, access to materials and workshops. We have a yeah, yeah. Do we have good equipment? Do we have good facilities? For, yeah, uh, yeah we, have, we, have, we have a workshop where people can like send and do like, use machines to cut wood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, such a, I'm doing such a bad job describing this. Uh, we have laser cutters, uh, 3D printers, CNC machines. Um, but granted, it's like, you need to learn how to use them so that like the, the personnel there can trust you to use it. And also some of them, like, you, um, we don't have direct access to it, so you have to request for permission, that kind of thing. Because some of um, like laser cutter, for instance, is like, you know, there are like, safety precautions and stuff, or like the huge CNC machine, which I don't know whether we still have, but um, yeah, so it also depends on... Um, as in, for each, like, they, they, they not be necessarily, like, accessible to you unless you're using it for a project, I think, like, for the big CNC machine or the CNC machines in general. Um, access to materials. Most of the time, we buy our own materials with our own money. Sometimes, some projects, there is a, uh, what do you call that, an allowance that um, the project will give. But personally, I, I haven't had any projects that gave me money. So <laughs> most of my materials are pocket, um, except for thesis. For thesis, we have some budget to do, like, prototyping and early research. Um, yeah, I would say majority of, of like materials will be out of pocket. Um, yeah. 
yeah, is that is that the question? Because I can't see the full question. Oh yeah, yeah. Like example for laser, I also can't really see the full question. Let me oh, see. Oh okay. <laughs> uh, I can see laser card working, but I can't see more than that already. Oh. Hey, something went on just now. I don't know why it got cut off. Um, don't know whether anyone still needs to join us. I know that we missed one question from Michael uh, Ambion or something like that. I remember the name. Um, so uh, just want to quickly cover that um, if possible. Uh, not sure if he's here. I don't see him here, so... Um, Hey, yeah, Karina. Hi. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody, somehow, somehow it went off just now. <laughs> so, uh, but but anyway, uh, there was only one question uh, that we've missed out. Uh, and I think we can take one more. I think I see another question coming in. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Let's answer the question that just came in first, right? Um, and then I think we can see if Michael, who has a question previously that didn't get answered, um, whether he comes back. If he comes back, we can answer that question. Okay, so uh, Carla2002, right, is saying, what is expected from your student, from the student portfolio? Am I supposed to answer that? Mm, you can answer first, yeah. But as in, this is for admissions, right? Yeah, actually, I should answer right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's it, there's no strict requirement, for example, like, um, oh, you must have how many works or you must have some ID background. No, none of that at all, because then many of us cannot get into the course ourselves. Right? Um, the uh, portfolio is basically a, uh, your compilation of, you know, uh, uh, your representation of things that you do that you think are in the kind of uh, creative space or in the entrepreneurial space, uh, anything that expresses to us your thinking process and your uh, capabilities. Sometimes you can show things that are related to skill sets too, like even like your ability to draw, ability to paint is fine. Um, the basically creative uh, creativity and entrepreneurial pursuits as well as your, if you're involved in any kind of social, um, uh, social kind of uh, what's that word uh, causes right uh, or you lead uh, certain uh, organizations or communities uh, feel free to share, share that with us and we've had students who come in and um, show us the kind of uh, really phenomenal tasks that they make right uh, yeah, so we've had that and uh, he's in DID now <laughs> right because uh, the way he talked about it um, showed that kind of consideration and the kind of craft and the rigor, you know, and the thinking. Um, we've also had students who um, appear in their videos in um, cosplay costumes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but they've all, all used it to their advantage to show like what they have uh, built, what they have, uh, you know, uh, what they have been interested in, uh, the kind of uh, culture and, and visuals and uh, innovation that they are immersing themselves in. Okay, so nobody is expecting you to have a design portfolio, nor an artistic uh, or like a fine arts uh, portfolio background. Um, you can certainly show things like things you've made in your spare time, things you've done because uh, you have more creative inclinations and in your, your schools in the past or your societies have asked you to do uh, brochures. Um, yeah, we, we get that quite a lot, right? And strangely, a lot of the DID uh, students, uh, they come with some kind of like a history like that. Um, where, where you know they, they you know in the course of their years in schools prior, um, they found themselves uh, being uh, interested to do these things or asked to do these things. So um, we often get that. Okay, um, yeah. So color two zero zero two. Um, show us what you think uh, is is a good representation of yourself, your creative pursuits, your entrepreneurial pursuits, your uh, social uh, interests. 
Okay. Um, certainly now, uh, more than ever, um, if you want to show us apps that you have built, uh, little coding projects, little technical things that you have uh, constructed, um, uh, maker events or hackathons that you have joined, right? Uh, yeah, those certainly are quite a timely thing, right? And you might have more of that than than, than art profiles now, I think. Okay, uh, let's see, is Michael here? Michael, let's see. Um, yeah, Michael asked a question because uh, but his question is not here anymore, right? Um, but uh, in case anybody has the same question or if he could revisit this later somehow, he was asking a question around, uh, and that was the last question, I think, and that's the last one maybe we'll cover. He asked a question around um, if he's uh, graduated from an arts program with bachelor's degree already, does he still go through the same admissions process and, you know, application? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I, if I'm not wrong, I think so. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. So um, the answer for this, some of these questions, they are more administrative, right? Uh, to be to be honest, uh, best uh, pathway, uh, join our Telegram channel, post it there, we'll, we'll get it answered. Okay, that's better. I don't want to anyhow say some things that are wrong instructions. But I believe, I believe if, if I were to just guess, I believe that uh, it should be the same process. Okay. Um, don't know if anybody else is uh, asking any questions, but I think uh, it's been more than an hour, right? Um, good to have all of you uh, here with us. Some of you we know are our students, some of you are guests. Um, Karina, any last words? Uh, no, I'm good. <laughs> good luck to everyone who wants to apply. Yeah. Hope to see you guys here. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, <laughs> what's the usual intake? It's a good one that you stick in uh, quickly. Um, so far, it's been around 40, 40 people. Yeah. Okay. And and Andriana has posted the Telegram link. Uh, you can just join that link. It should be rather clear. Okay. I'm just going to leave this on for a while so that you can catch that link. Yeah, uh, Colored 2002, right? Um, just a little tip. Uh, we are often oversubscribed by more than a few times. Um, but here's a little tip. Um, try to make it to the interview, right? Because like I said earlier on, the admissions interview, um, whether is it digitally done now or not, um, if you make it there, the interview is what counts, uh, not so much your scores, okay? Um, yeah, so in case you have such concerns. All right. Okay. Bye bye. I'm going to shut this down. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Thanks, Karina. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.